Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Nut Closer Show. As always, I'm Scott Carson, and I'm excited to be back here with you guys. Whether you're watching this live on Facebook or you're listening to this on one of our multiple podcast platforms, we are excited to have you listening and joining us in. So literally got back in yesterday, or actually late yesterday uh, evening from traveling to Raleigh-Durham. I spoke uh, Tuesday night at the TRIA Real Estate Investors Association. They had about 200 plus uh, in the room, which is really great. It's always nice to speak to a <clears throat> packed audience. I guess they've just under a thousand members in total. But a uh, uh, big shout out to the staff over there, Patrick, and everybody else that helped out with that. It was really great. Um, always nice running into people. Um, definitely great to see one of our mastermind students, Natasha Hunter, who's moved from, you know, Cape Coral area up to the Raleigh Durham area. She was great stuff there. So good to see her. Shout out to her. Um, but mostly, I think there's only like two people that actually have, have even heard of me at that group. So it was nice being at an event and speaking to a kind of a, a very fresh audience. Uh, Natasha, another guy actually, actually take that back, had actually heard of me, but another only one other person actually listened to the podcast before. So hopefully some of you guys are listening this morning. See, we've seen a boost in uh, listening from that area now in the last couple of days, which is great. But anyway, it's always great at talking, networking with people. Uh, especially real estate investors, you know, I always enjoy a chance to speak and give my my little plug out. But um, one of the things I've always noticed and was actually talking with the, the, you know, the advisory board, the people that run the club is they like, they are very much like a bunch of other real estate clubs. They're having a slowdown in attendance. They noticed they're actually having people, you know, they get a lot, a lot of registrants, but they're having, People aren't showing up as much as they used to, and I see, I hear that from a lot of real estate investment clubs. I hear that from big groups that they're seeing a decline in attendance. I see that in speakers all the time talking about that, or people that are putting on events. It's hard to put butts, you know, butts in seats at events, and that's unfortunate. And I think a lot of that comes from that one of two things: one, you've got, uh, you've got to literally work constantly to market to people. You've got to work constantly to communicate with them on different le different levels. And a lot of investment clubs are still doing the same old, same old. They're doing the same thing as they were doing years ago. And you've got to evolve and use technology. Like I was asking the club presence there, I said, well, do you ever live stream any of this? Do you ever record any of this and, and promote this to their website? First of all, the club didn't have an Instagram account. Uh, the club has a decent website. It could be updated, but they also, but they're not doing anything really online. I, I hardly saw any social media posts. I've seen very little activity from the group. And I think they've got to realize they've got to boost it. And talking with the group members, they're an older crowd and there's nothing wrong with that. But they have a, you know, there's an age kind of gap between the old guard and the new guard coming aboard. And the group had a great, you know, you know, there was a lot of great people there, a really warm crowd, responsive. They asked a lot of questions, which is nice. But I, I see a gap in a lot of things in, in taking place. And this is happening more and more across the country, more and more real estate clubs I talk to or talk in front of. They're not communicating effectively. Yes, email is a great way to do it. Yes, having a meetup group is a great way to do it. Having a website is a great way. But if you're not sharing what's going on, it's difficult to do that. And you have to evolve. And... That leads me kind of to this discussion of what this episode is all about. It's about the evolution of the real estate investor. It's the evolution of, you know, what are we doing? Where are we going? You know, where have you come from? And it's good to see people out there watching this morning. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, morning, you guys. Uh, hi, Christina. Good to see you. Glad you're listening in. Robert Burrell, everybody. Um, <clears throat> the thing I want you guys to realize is that we all grow as investors. We all start off somewhere brand new and you evolve over time, or hopefully you evolve over time. There's a lot of people that I've known that have evolved a little bit and they get stuck in one thing and they don't grow as individuals. They don't grow as investors and you have to really look to grow to take your business to the next levels or evolve as the market changes. And one thing I was listening to at this investment club, and I listen to a lot of investment clubs, and I hear people all the time saying, oh, I can't find deals. 
It's too tight. It's too expensive. When I ask that, a lot of people raise their hands about things. And I'm like, well, what are you doing to market or to uh, tweak the things you're doing? Because if what you're looking for is drying up, you've got to evolve or what is going to happen? You're going to starve to death or you're going to die as an investor. Oh, you can't do that. That doesn't work. You got to evolve. You've got to learn to evolve as an investor. So where do most people start off? Well, when we all start off, we've got to learn. We got, we've got education. We've got to learn, right? Education is going to local investment clubs. It's watching videos, jumping on webinars, going to educational events, and learning the different topics. That's that's the first point, okay? And a lot of people like to put you know, the idea of, oh, I have a different tool in my tool belt. I get it. You start off like that. There's a lot of people that are in <clears throat> these guys talked about, I was talking to them, so, hey, who's, who's been one of your better speakers? Like, oh, we had such and such come and they did a lot of stuff. And I was like, okay, yeah, he's going to do a lot of stuff that tells me about your group is you've got a lot of newbies because this guy teaches a lot of wholesaling, talks a lot about options, talks about doing a lot of things to start off with to make things. And it's one of the ways that I learned early on, okay? Totally agree to that. But you have to evolve. If you're only holding your people at the, the base level of stuff and never evolving, doing advanced technologies or taking advantage of what's going on in the market, you're hurting yourself, okay? And I only say that as a true entrepreneur who's evolved over time to doing a lot of things. And we have another evolution that we're working through right now too. But so you go to all these things and, and really the first place that everybody starts off at besides being education, okay, is wholesaling. Usually wholesaling, why do people like wholesaling? <clears throat> people like wholesaling because it doesn't require their own funds, okay? There's no really commitment. They can often walk away if the deal doesn't work out, all right? It also allows them to try to feel like they're doing something. Oh, I'm marketing or I'm advertising this deal that's for a wholesale deal. And it's unfortunate that a lot of people still don't market effectively when it comes to that base level. And I'm, by marketing effectively, I mean knowing the true numbers of the deal. You know, you know many of you guys that uh, follow us or follow our tribe, and we've got some people, some characters in here, and it drives me bonkers, drives people like Dan Zatoski bonkers, everybody bonkers when people go, oh, I've got a deal. I'm like, what are the numbers? Well, I don't know the numbers of the deal. Is it really a deal? Uh, are you, the house is only going to be worth 100 if you put 40 grand into it and you want 60 for the deal? That's not a deal. There's no, those numbers don't make sense. So wholesalers is where everybody starts off with. I start off wholesaling, yes. I was just trying to make 500,000. You know, I've had some big wholesale deals over the years. I still wholesale notes occasionally, but that's where everybody starts off at. It's the easiest thing. Put something under contract, sell to somebody else, especially if you've got a coach or somebody else that's kind of holding your hands that they can help you out with marketing of that. That's a great place. Now, what you should be doing with wholesaling is you should be making money, but also putting a little bit of that money in reserve, okay? Putting a little bit of money in savings. If you're doing putting everything in to pay your bills, you need to either increase your activity or you need to start marketing a little differently or for different deals. If you're driving around looking for ugly properties or driving a lot around just looking at other wholesale deals, it's too incestuous. You've got to expand it, especially in today's market, today's world. You've got to really get outside, especially if you're in a market that's very tough, like Austin here. I, I can remember years ago, and there's very a few wholesalers that were here that had some big lists and stuff like that. Now you don't see that much available because it's basically everything's overpriced for the most part. All right. Unless you've got a pocket listing or pick up something in probates or something like that. You know, there's, you know, or you're marketing to a list of equity owners or out of state owners, you still got to get very creative. So wholesaling is the first thing. Next thing a lot of people like to look at is subject twos. All right. I mean, wholesaling and options are kind of saying, put something under an option agreement and then drown sell that market off. Okay. Next thing a lot of people like to do is subject to deals. This is where you can find something that has a really good low mortgage payment. Maybe they're behind on payments, or they got a preferential loan in place. All right. Thing you have to keep in mind with subject twos is hopefully they don't have too much in rearages or they're too far behind their mortgage to take that over. So subject two deals can be a phenomenal way of buying something that's got great rate on it. Take it over, sort of to the existing financing. Hopefully, you don't have to pay too big a lump sum to either the existing borrower or the person who owns the property for you to take it over. A lot of times, people walk away. Now, the whole idea is basically arbitraging between that existing mortgage, that subject to deal, 
and finding something, hopefully the property has a higher market rent rate. I'll give an example. Say it's worth 120, the mortgage is for you know 90, uh, mortgage payment's 600, market rent's 1200. Maybe you can find somebody coming in and buy it and you turn it into a rental and you're making $600 a month. Or you owner finance it to somebody, do a wraparound mortgage, and then you're making the difference that between their payment and your payment that you've gotta be paying the subject to your bank. So that's the thing. Subject twos can be a great way to make money done a lot of two deals over the day. And we kind of do that with a little bit of, we do the kind of, I guess you say reverse subject to, with this being the bank, we're allowing our borrower, especially on some of these contract for deeds, to let other people take over their mortgage. Let them, other people assume the mortgage, okay? So that's that's a really great thing. I would be looking, if if I was a new real estate investor, I could buy anything, they get wholesale or put option on. I would be looking for people that I'd take over subject to. Okay. It's like a little blunt like that comment. Clap, clap. Yeah. Lower's done some subject to deals, if I remember correctly. So that's kind of the evolution. Now, you go from wholesaling and options to subject to deals. You got to be a little more fancy, get a little bit more marketing, you got to reach out to people to try to, you know, people to wrap around your existing mortgage with taking things over subject to. The next phase, next evolution is kind of light rehabs. Pie something, you want to put paint carpet on. Pretty much pretty houses. You don't really want to do a lot of heavy rehabs when you're brand new because you really don't have a lot of experience, okay? Um, light rehabs, you can still use hard money for them. Uh, you know, funding these things. We're going to be actually buying assets for the most part. And you got to have funding, with it, whether it's private capital or hopefully the property has hard, can qualify for hard money. Uh, what is great to see was when I was in Raleigh, Durham, as I saw the guys from Longhorn Investments, uh, Merrill Kaiser out of Dallas and our friends up that neck of the woods, literally being a hard money lender in Charlotte, which I kind of laughed at because I see a lot of hard money lenders. There's a lot of money out in the, in the industry right now trying to be deployed because there's so much of it out there. They're trying to finance a lot of things. And so I kind of chuckle with that. I have to give a big shout out to our friend Wendy Sweet at Carolina Hard Money. Um, she was not there last night, but one of her reps were there. So it was good to see uh, somebody from her group as well. But doing small rehabs, paint carpet, nothing too heavy is the next kind of evolution for real estate investors. Okay. Do that. Like I said, you want to be looking at your assets being on or off the market within six months, preferably. Um, if you're buying something where the days on market are over 180, 210 days, you got to be very careful that your pricing and that your money costs don't eat up most of your profits. Because a lot of people forget that, A, if you're more into your interest rate on your hard money loans, 10 12%, that can be a nice chunk of your profit if it drags on to a year. Okay. Uh, Laura says lipstick fix, paint and flowers in the yard. Yeah, exactly. Throwing some, you know, green grass down, making everything curb appeal. Yeah, that's a great thing. Exactly. Lipstick fix, <laughs> putting a little paint, <laughs> lipstick on a pig, basically trying to get it <laughs> pretty up. Um, the next phase from that, from doing the light rehabs, will be going to heavier rehabs. Um, cut your teeth on the light stuff. Oftentimes you'll find, like I'll give an example. I was talking with a big investor in Houston. And he's saying, hey, what we find out is that we do some rehabs, but actually about 75% of our business comes from wholesaling. And we save the really nice rehab projects that we know we're going to really hit home runs with for the ones we focus on. My buddy Brad Chandler out in Washington, D.C. is doing a lot of that stuff. So he's wholesaling. He gets a lot of leads in that D.C., Baltimore area. Wholesales a lot off on the ones that he knows that are within roughly an hour, maybe half hour his office is what he focuses on as far as the rehab stuff and things. And that's the thing. You really don't want to be doing rehabs all the way across the country uh, unless you've got family, you've got a really great crew there, something that you really, really trust. Most of the time, you want to do your stuff where you can see that stuff because, honestly, a lot of the contractors will eat you alive. The vendor's not showing up on time or showing up late. They're not doing a complete job. You have to be very, very careful. If you're going to be doing rehabs, heavy rehabs, you have to have really a full-time GC to help you at this. You've got to have a full-time team to help you when you're doing stuff. If you're traveling across the country or buying in multiple markets, trying to do heavy rehabs across the country, they will eat you a lot and it's not something you're going to enjoy. You will lose money and you don't want to do that. Trust me, I know this. Voice of experience here, okay? Stick to one or a couple markets for your rehabs. All right. After that, the heavy rehabs, then you kind of go into the commercial side or lending side. Um, you know, commercial can be great. It's a, there's so many little niches inside of commercial. You want to make sure and specialize. You don't want to try to 
what's the word I'm trying to be here? Jack of all trades. Like, oh, I'm going to do a you know strip mall. I'm going to do some raw land development. I'm going to do an apartment complex, or I'm going to do, you know, whatever. And I'm uh, industrial. Focus on one niche. And if you, what you're focused on, and you'll be the happiest when it comes down to things. Okay, there's a lot of different things, and commercial is a big boy game. It's not a well, I'm going to send it out on an email and blast it out and find a buyer for the deal in six hours. No, most of your commercial projects are going to take a couple months, a couple months of negotiation, a month or two due diligence, and going from there. You know, we've had people on here before, like uh, Martin Stein talked about how he finds industrial complexes around the New Jersey, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm New Jersey area, but Arlington, Virginia area, and he sells those off to other people, gets owner financing, then wraps around the existing financing or subject to financing. That's a great, great plan. Awesome. I think it's a great thing. Just going to be very careful in commercial. It's not overpriced. It's not going to be a lot of work and stuff. Uh, I see people that dive into commercial right off the bat because that's the way they want to go. Oh, I want to be the big thing. I don't do any of this lower stuff. And they bomb because they don't have the experience. They don't have the reserves. Commercial is a big boys game. You got to expect to put some money out in due diligence, repairs, and things like that. That's why often people will jump on the lending side, start lending money out, either you know some mezzanine, short-term financing, three to six months, or doing some hard money stuff. You know, they become the lenders and they're getting the paper game at that point. And that's why note investing or the people that are buying debt is really the most advanced, most evolved investor animal, I guess you could say. Um, because the fact is that we understand all that other stuff going on and you understand the numbers, what's going on and really where the debt game is and being able to negotiate debt, the, that debt with the banks or the hedge funds selling stuff. So that's why yeah, we like to say that note investors are the most evolved homo sapiens out there. <laughs> but if you look at that, think about it, it's kind of a transition. When I was speaking the other night and I asked, okay, who's doing this? Raise your hands. Who's doing this? Raise your hands. Who's doing this? And just seeing the evolution as the number gets smaller as it goes up that scale. As you evolve, that number becomes less and less. Your competition becomes less and less. Why? Because people get stuck or only... Honestly, five to ten percent of people will do anything any any point or anyway. And stick to it long term. I had somebody talk about, oh, isn't there a lot of competition since you're out here speaking, others speaking? I'm like, no, not really. Only five to ten percent of people will do something. If they, you know, if they don't do something, hey, it's not my my not my fault. And that's why I always try to work when I'm speaking, trying to give as much information as I can to let them understand it's not as complex as it I mean, most people would like to make it out to be. So questions, comments from everybody that's listening out there, watching on Facebook Live this morning, across the board on the evolution. Uh, for those who've been around, you know, does that make sense? You know, if you're still trying to wholesale and you've been doing this for a couple of years and you've still never wholesaled anything, you, you got to change your tactic or either charge what, change what you're focused on. Because if you're just running around attending events, there's nothing wrong with attending and getting education. But if you're not taking action, you're not helping yourself in any form or fashion. And, and by action, initially, it's, you know, I did a lot of things when I got started. Door knocking, driving looking at ugly houses. I sent yellow letters, postcards. I still get yellow, yellow letters to this day from people who see some of our vacant homes that we've in the process of foreclosing on or selling. I see a lot of stuff who are just pulling lists and sending things out and, and hoping that, they, that they'll bite. Somebody will bite on that thing. So that what's you have to look at it. If you're investing in a market that's hot, like here in, here in Austin or Southern California, you got to get creative, or you may look want to look to, to outside markets or sub markets to make things happen. Like when we had Aliyah Ott and Terry Garner who handled the self storage side, they were mentioning that, that they're not buying a lot of their stuff in primary markets. It's secondary markets. You know, markets that are a little bit smaller than the main areas because they're finding deals there. There's not as much competition there, like Dallas, Houston, Austin. You know, San Antonio, those are four major markets here in Texas. A lot of competition taking place, especially a lot of people in San Antonio are seeing investors coming from Austin to buy there because Austin's overpriced. Okay. A lot of people from Dallas are moving to Fort Worth or people in Austin are looking to Houston or vice versa. So the thing to keep in mind, everybody, is as you evolve, your markets are probably going to evolve uh, to find something that makes sense to identify ROIs that make sense. And then, of course, ROT a return on time for the last thing you want to do is bust your ass and send out a lot of mailers, do a lot of marketing, only a couple of leads. Um, you know, get a couple of leads for stuff like that. So Robert asked a question here because any particular reason 
you went to this event. I know you got a lot of invitations, so just curious why you choose this particular one. Thanks. So, Robert, that's a great question. Yeah. So, I got a lot of invitations to speak, and I turn it down. Turn it down a variety of reasons. When I'm looking to speak somewhere, I want usually I'm not only going to go to something that's at least where they have a consistently 100 people show up or more. Okay. 100 people or more. And it's also got to be an investment club that charges either monthly or annually. Uh, free meetup groups, free investment clubs, not worth going to. You have a lot of tire kickers there. There's no investment by um, the members. And if I'm going to take my time to go out there and then offer up our workshops, I want to make sure that there's actually valuable buyers there. People who will actually buy the workshop who have something to buy with. If it's just a free event and there's tire kickers there, it's not a good result. I would rather deal with 20 people that have paid to an event than go to something where there's 200 people that haven't paid at all. Okay. So that's it. Um, consistency, people showing up, at least 100 plus or more in the last three months straight. They have a membership fee of some sort, whether it's at the door, it's monthly or annually. And then I also ask who has spoken at the club recently. Because if there's been another note investors type at the club previously me showing up, it's going to re reduce the attendance ratio because they're like, oh, no, it's oh, I had somebody speak at our club last month. I'm not going to go this month. So that's what we look at. Those are kind of the three biggest things. And then, of course, fourth, does it fit in my schedule? This happened to fit my schedule um, barely, you know, once we got back. And then also before I head out, uh, we head out on a little bit of extended vacation here this week. Okay. So that's the reason I picked that, Robert. Hopefully that makes sense. You know, um, so, you know, I just want to make sure it's it's advantageous for everybody. Um, now, it doesn't mean I won't I will turn down clubs that don't have 100 people or they are free. In those clubs I'm not going to travel to. I'm not going to spend money out of my pocket to travel, but I'd be glad to jump onto a webinar and provide education. I do a lot of webinars that um, that's just information. It's not pitching. It's not any type of class sales. It's just giving them providing information. I do a lot of podcast uh, interviews that way too. So. If you're listening out there and you do run an investment club and you, or you're a member of one, hey, I'd be glad to come out and speak, provided that we kind of hit those things. Now, I did, I did have a group get up, upset at me in January because I turned them down. Um, when I'd spoken to them before a year ago, the, guy, the, the new person called me up and was like, oh, would you like to come speak? I'm like, yeah, sure, glad. And then I asked him, so you, you guys are charging, right? Still, so he goes, oh, no, we've now, we're, we're now a free club. I'm like, oh, I, I sorry, I'm not going to come out. And he got upset. I'm like, it's just not worth my time to drop a grand in travel costs and take time away from my schedule unless I know that there's going to be people and butts in the seats that listen to me when I get there. So I got some people commenting on that. So true. Thanks, Christina. Uh, Laura says, makes perfect sense about the evolution. I call notes the next step in investing. Yeah, it's the next step. And it's really the big step. If you look at who's in the paper game, you get the banks, the biggest banks, you know, the biggest institutions out there, the biggest buildings. These people understand the paper game. And whether you believe it or not, everybody, if you're listening on this, you have any sort of payment you're paying out monthly, student loans, credit cards, car payment, house payment, whatever it might be, you're in the debt game. You're just usually on the other side where you're paying versus receiving. And anytime you can receive, receiving is much better than having to, to pay. Trust me on that stuff. Questions, comments, concerns from anybody out there, out there watching? Um, we are uh, going to give a big shout out to some of our friends that are out in San Diego. Um, flew out yesterday. Uh, the Magnify Your Wealth Summit started today, runs through Saturday with Lawful Associates there at the Dana Resort. I'm actually jumping on a plane tonight, going to make an appearance out there tomorrow and then fly back Saturday morning here to Austin before we head out, before Steph and I head out on another trip on Tuesday morning. But um, Steph's not heading with me. She's staying here to knock out some stuff as well. But we'll be making an appearance. So anybody's out there in San Diego, you can see us at the the uh, that event i highly encourage you uh, if you're listening to this on the podcast on the podcast platform check out grow in 2018 um it's definitely or grow in 2019 if you're listening to this is an older episode uh, aaron does a really great job with his uh magnifier wealth summits hosts them twice a year and so you can always find out what's going on at grow in 2018 or grow in 2019 for the for next year's events twice a year well worth it one of the best events you want to go to because not only does it break down for the asset protection side and really give you some great, great, great options for you to build your kind of your structure as you grow. And we all are growing and all and closing more deals and doing more amazing things. You have to have an advanced asset protection that grows with you as well. So part of the reason I'm flying out there is just to meet with my attorneys 
on our asset protection, our Rockefeller strategy. Um, you know, Kevin Day, Brent Biscay, definitely looking forward to hanging out with them a little bit. Business with Aaron Kors, got some things we're running by him on a couple ideas for some things future on. So questions, comments, what other things you guys talking about or concerned about today and the evolution of real estate investors? Now, I know a lot of people get very busy in the education side as far as learning. They want to digest and learn everything. At some point, you have to start taking action and making offers or closing on bigger deals or talking with people. Now, if you've burnt some bridges by running all over and acting like a crazy person with your head cut off, you maybe need to build some bridges first. Show people that you're around a little bit. If you're going to real estate investment clubs, you got to go consistently. I still think there's a great way to meet people, to raise capital, to find investors. One of the best ways to do things. Um, you just got to show up on a regular basis and you can't sit by yourself in the corner. You got to get up, talk to people, network. Hey, what are you doing? What are you focused on? And, you know, how can I help or can we work together? Uh, oftentimes you'll find some great people to work with that aren't necessarily joint venture partners, but maybe more so accountability partners. OK, that's a uh, important aspect of things, having somebody there that you can network with. Not really a mastermind. Because that's a, a different thing, but definitely accountability is huge and, and needed things so much more, especially when you're brand new, whereas a lot of people struggle with accountability when they're getting rocking and rolling because they just flake. And if you're going to flake on yourself, which, look, everybody flakes on themselves. That's easy. Well, I can flake on me. It's not a big deal. But when you have somebody else that you're accountable to, uh, a friend, and how you say you're going to do that, you're going to get together and network, or you're going to get together and break down some lists of deals. You're less likely to flake when you've got somebody else out there who's holding you accountable than yourself. Look, we'll give up on going to the gym on a nightly basis. I'm not going to go to the gym, but if you got somebody who's going to meet you there and spot you while you're pumping iron or going to get there and do some cardio with you, you're less likely to flake on them because you don't want them to give you shit. <laughs> All right. So finding an accountability partner, somebody that's working in the same, maybe same experience level. It's often great to find people that are closing deals that are a step above you because as you grow as an investor, you're going to find new mentors. You're going to find new people that you work with. You're going to find new people that can help you go to that promised land or maybe they're not yet at. But the best way to build a business is to model it after people that are successful. Do the things that others are doing to make things happy. So that's the best thing I can tell you about going to local real estate clubs. Now, I want to make sure there's two types of clubs out there for the most part. You have the clubs that are really member focused or you have the clubs that are uh, management focused where everything in the club is the lead back to the, the person running the club. You know, I've seen these clubs and this is where, oh, everything's got to be focused so that we can get business. Summer. Not really worried about the students, what they want, but what we can do to focus business and be careful of those clubs. Um, when they're so focused is putting money in the um, pockets of those that are running a club versus deal focused or content for the group members. Those are clubs you want to avoid. Um, there are some shysters out there that run clubs that just aren't, I really don't think are ethical. If you're going to run a, a real estate investment club, you got to have it focused on what your members want. You're leading that tribe. And if you're leading that tribe just to be self-centered for what you're focused on, you're really doing investors a, dis, a disservice uh, as a leader of that investment club. Okay. Fortunately, there's a few of those around the area here. Um, you know, but if you look anywhere, guys, You'll find in most of the major cities, there'll be investment clubs either meet in the morning and over lunches or in the evenings. Usually once, twice a month, once a week, sometimes it varies. You can often find by going to meetup.com, jumping on there and looking, just doing a search in your area for real estate clubs, seeing the members, seeing the most active, or just talk to just talk to people, you know, talk to people in your area. You'll often, you know, that's the best way to start and to go out from there. Cool. What are the questions, comments, concerns you guys have for this day? Look, every, everybody... Uh, evolves. Okay. Oh yes, Milton. Thank you. Thank you very much, Milton. Milton says this. Don't forget about the guru clubs. LOL. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there are some guru clubs out there um, where all they do is just cycle through speakers. You know, I've spoke at some of these clubs. I'm not going to lie. They brought me in to speak. They, you know, want me to sell my workshops and that's fine. Hey, it's a win-win across the board. Um, but you have to also be prepared for that too. Like if they don't focus on what's going on, if they don't have a session focused on haves and wants or haves and needs or breaking it up or, or SIG groups, you know, 
it's good to have a SIG group and why the SIG group special interest group part of the investment club. I know that some people like Bill Grismer runs a SIG group for the Ohio area on notes and some other things like that too. So that's great. Good stuff. So thanks for sharing on that. Milton forgot about that completely. All right. Um, there's also, um, I'll give you an example. Um, some big clubs that are just kind of focused on there. You got, um, was it like lifestyles here in Texas that focuses on kind of apartment lending, but using the residential side to build up your reserves so that they, they can then buy an apartment. Nothing wrong with that group. Uh, there are lots of great people there. You know, they put on a big event in Houston every February, I believe, too. Um, but they've also got their chapters in San Antonio, Austin, Houston, and, and Dallas as well. So great place to go. Learn, learn, meet up with some people like, like-minded and really develop your contacts to make things happen. So there's no any other questions, comments, or concerns, guys. That's the thing. Look at where you're at today. Figure out where you want to be tomorrow or in the future. Look, I didn't get to where I was today immediately. It took a while. And this is why I always laugh um, when people get all bent out of shape. I've talked to other speakers like, oh, I, I went and spoke at a club. It was horrible. I was like, well, did you really talk to them? Have you followed up with the people that you met? I mean, look, I, I always like getting in front of fresh audiences. I don't judge my success at a real estate investment club based on just the sales from that night. I look at long term because, hey, I'm going to plant a seed. I'm going to be like, the movie Inception, I'm going to plant a seed in their brain. It's going to evolve, eventually take over that brain where they're going to understand I should have been a note investor or they're going to start researching things. And that's why we do so many episodes. That's why we have the podcast. That's why we have our No Night in America videos. That's why we do Note Camp. And why we share that stuff is because that's the best way to get the word out so that eventually in three months, six months, nine months after people have watched every video and I get people that come up and say, I've watched all your videos or watch you for the last six months. Now I'm ready to do something. Now I'm ready to come to a workshop. That's the whole focus. Plant a seed and understand that people have their own time frame to get where they need to be. It may not be immediate thing where they do something, but as they grow, as they evolve to get to the point where they're ready to become a note investor, that's the whole focus. That's the whole deal. And I think a lot of people fail to realize that is not everybody is on your timeline. Okay. The investors you work with, the people that you're working with, they have their own timeline. They have their own drama. They have their own life they've got to deal with. And then they have, they have the dominoes they've got to knock down before they get to that big domino of whatever that may be. So for those of you that are out there struggling, working, evolving, keep up the good work. Don't ever give up on what you're focused on, your dreams. Go make something happen. And eventually, we'll see you all at the top, everybody. Have a great day. Go out, make something yourself. And uh, we'll see you all later.